Thank you. Um, anyways, my name is Colin Taylor. Uh, I work for IBM, and this is applying object character recognition and Kubernetes to Twitch, which is full of buzzwords. Uh, so, like I said, my name is Colin. Um, I'm Eggshell on GitHub or Freenode at, at Eggshell Colin on Twitter and all the other things. Uh, I work at IBM as a developer advocate, um, and I'm a native Texan, and I have a quote unquote cloudy background. Um, I worked on Automation and tooling around OpenStack deployments. Um, ran a lot of deployments for OpenStack. Um, kind of cut my teeth that way. So, um, other people that made this talk possible: uh, Rogel Deo, uh, Spencer Crumb, Will Plus, Mike Peterson, and Ryan Mo. This is about half of my immediate team or so, and uh, they have all contributed significantly uh, to this project. So I absolutely couldn't have done it without them, so I wanted to thank them, and I also wanted to thank um, Linux Us Northwest for having me out. I really appreciate it, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, but anyways, uh, we focus on advocating for a managed Kubernetes platform. It's similar to a GKE um, or AWS's thing, which whose name I can't remember, um, as well as for open source container technologies in general, so, you know, Docker, Containerd, all that stuff. Um, and this is a quote I really like. Um, we write some hacks that some of them become standards, and this is the history of software engineering. Um, this will come up later, so keep that in mind. So kind of here's an agenda. Uh, we'll have a brief explanation of the Battle Royale genre. Who here is familiar? Okay, so about half the room. Yeah, I'll, I'll make it a quick crash course, um, but I just want to get everybody up to speed and kind of level set. Uh, we'll talk about you know the beginning of the idea, initial attempts, um, the current main application flow, um, how we use machine learning to train a neural net um, to improve our object character recognition. Uh, we'll go light into the Kubernetes deployment with Helm. So these two things kind of got added in in the past, I don't know, 10 days or so. So I had to like kind of retool this talk. Um, and then we'll kind of wrap up. And please, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take them. I don't like waiting till the end and then having to go back through the slides, so just raise your hand. Um, so anyways, uh, this project is called Rotisserie. Um, it's a web app for passively viewing streams on Twitch, uh, most notably for uh, the game Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Um, has anybody here played the game? Cool, awesome. Uh, we will be porting to Fortnite at some point uh, very soon. So. Anyways, it borrows from the NFL Red Zone concept, um, and the application engine is written entirely in Node.js. The object character rec recognition engine is written in Python and uses TensorFlow to do all the machine learning stuff. Um, I'm not, I'm going to go into it, but not super, super deep, um, because my machine learning knowledge is about as deep as a puddle. So, um, but we previously used Tesseract, which is as old as time itself, and it was pretty unreliable, but it was good for our proof of concept. Um, cool. So let's go for a crash course in Battle Royale. Uh, so in, this is an abridged version uh, of the Battle Royale genre. You can go back even further than this, but we'll start uh, kind of our flashpoint at March of 2017. Uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds was released uh, into Steam's early access program, which is kind of their beta, hey, uh, come pay, reduce price, or maybe it's free, uh, for my game. and. Uh, you know, it might be buggy or not have engine optimizations or whatever. Uh, and then, you know, you can just have the game um, before it hits 1.0. Uh, it garnered a pretty massive player base. Uh, it still has a pretty huge player base. It has well over, um, you know, 400,000, 500,000 concurrent players still at pretty much any given time, which is about 150,000 more than the previous leader, which was Dota 2. Um, and, but that's on Steam. Um, so, you know, I'm obviously ignoring Origin and any of the other game clients out there. Um, and then in September of 2017, kind of the com main competitor and now, you know, leader of the Battle Royale genre uh, was released. Uh, it's Epic's Fortnite Battle Royale um, and kind of just set the world on fire. I mean, you have now it runs on phones. Kids are playing it while they're at school, annoying their teachers. Um, they've got 45, they boast 45 million players and they average about 3 million concurrent users, so about six times what PUBG normally gets. So that's kind of the classic, um, you know, Dota League of Legends sort of problem where a genre forms, two big games come up, and now you have every other company in the industry trying to make a Battle Royale mode uh, for their game, but 
most likely won't succeed. Uh, so the basic mechanics of Battle Royale is players will parachute or drop onto an island or just randomly spawn or whatever. Um, they have, typically will have no gear. Uh, they should have to loot buildings for randomly generated gear. After landing, uh, you can typically queue solo uh, just by yourself against you know 90 or so other people. Duos, uh, which is teams of two or three or four person squads. Um, and the last person standing wins. And it literally pops up winner, winner, chicken dinner in PUBG whenever you win. Um, and you just kind of win by any means possible. The only real thing you have to do is to stay inside these circles. Um, so on the map, you'll get uh, a circle that you have to be in, and then a second circle will form around it. And that second circle will slowly close in to the perimeter of the first circle. And if you're outside that second circle, you, uh, your character will bleed health kind of until you die. Um, and once, once you're dead, you're out. You just breed kill. There's no response. Um, so, you know, here's an example of a map uh, in, in PUBG. I know that doesn't really look great, um, but if you're following along with the slides, it might look a little better. And here's an example of the circle. See, that looks terrible. Anyways, there's a victory. Uh, so let's get into the idea. So uh, the part of, of PUBG that's, that's really fun is, is this end game where there's you know, less than 10 people in the game, less than 15 people in the game. Uh, the really, really boring part of watching this game on Twitch is kind of in the beginning when people drop and they're looting or they're just running across the map for 15 minutes trying to stay inside the circle or you know, whatever else. Um, the engagements are, are kind of fun to watch along the way, but really the most interesting part is kind of at the end, um, kind of similar to you know, seeing an NFL team in th inside 20 yards. That's, that's where fun stuff happens. Uh, so the idea uh, kind of stemmed from a trip that I took with one of my coworkers to uh, Jönköping, Sweden. That's this beautiful little town down here. Uh, to DreamHack. Um, is anybody here familiar with DreamHack? It's a giant land, it looks like that. Uh, people go there and play video games, and they typically also have um, competitive teams, you know, um, they usually have different tournaments going on there. Um, but anyway, so we're there, and we're sitting in a bar, kind of at the end of the day, just talking, and uh, we notice that in this bar, it's like a, it, it's really like a facsimile of like an American sports bar in there. They have a wall with Tom Brady all that fun stuff. Um, but they have a bunch of TVs, as you normally would, that uh, would be normally be playing you know, soccer or something like that. Um, and they were playing uh, Counter-Strike, since all the people were there for DreamHack. Uh, they want to be there watching Counter-Strike, watching video games. So every you know, five, 10 minutes or so, the bartender would have to go and find a different stream to watch that would be considered more interesting, because a match of Counter-Strike would end or something like that, and they would you know, go to break. So we were thinking of ways that we could apply maybe some you know, computer vision concepts to Counter-Strike to try and determine what would be an interesting stream on Twitch for Counter-Strike. But the problem with that is that Counter-Strike looks like this. Uh, or a stream of Counter-Strike looks like this, at least. And there's a lot going on. So you might be focused on the team names. You might be focused on who's won more rounds. You might be focused on which round it is. There in the top, you, know, you see round 12 and 30. Uh, you might be focused on how much money they have. You might be focused on which uh, professional players on the team. You might be focused on which weapons they have, um, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, what map they're on, how much money a given player has. There's just there's way too many things. We were like drawing it out on napkins and we were like, this is never gonna work. Um, but my coworker turns to me and says, what if you just have one number? What if you just had that? And that's all you had to look at. So, uh, we immediately, you know, get out of the bar, run back, and start writing a shell script because that's how all good projects are formed. Uh, but anyways, that's kind of the genesis of the app. Um, does anybody have any questions about, like, Battle Royale in general? Anything I can clear up? Cool. Um, so this is the general application architecture. Um, it's a little bit outdated since it still has the Tesseract stuff on there, um, but I didn't have time to go back and edit this thing, so I'll do that later. But anyways, uh, a, a user, you know, hits our web UI, and in the background, there's uh, uh, 
uh, all these Kubernetes pods uh, running this stuff. So like, this is one Kubernetes pod. This is one Kubernetes pod. And we have some other stuff that gets us like our TLS encryption and uh, other fun stuff like that. So we can have HTTPS. Uh, but anyways, the, the general idea is that you make a Twitch API call, you record some footage, you take a screenshot of that footage so you have a single frame, and then you crop it down to where you would just have that number. And then you take that, that cropped image, you shove it into our OCR service, and it gets you back some plain text with a number. So that way you just have a number, and you associate that with each stream that you get out of the Twitch API, and then you can just sort that and display that in an iframe on a web page. And that's like kind of the 10,000 foot view of how that works. So making Twitch API calls, we just grab a list of streamers. Um, Twitch has a, um, a REST API, and it returns you back a JSON payload of streams and tons of metadata, like more than you could possibly even want. Uh, but we just focus on stream names and a couple other things, like um, English language. So the reason that we focus on English language is back here. See where it says alive in the top right? If, uh, if they have their game language, like the actual game client language set to something else, say they have it set to you know, um, something using this really in alphabet, then it'll change the size of that box and uh, it, it throws off our ability to accurately grab um, that pixel space. And then the other, go ahead. I mean, is it that hard to just increase your box size in, in retrospect or whatever? Um, is it like the size of the data you kept? So kind of in the beginning, whenever we were just using Tesseract, we didn't want anything else in there but just the number. But now that um, we're kind of training our own models, um, then yeah, we can totally do that. Um, thank you. I didn't think of that. <laughs> Again, uh, this is a lot of this stuff is kind of new, so I haven't thought about it as much as I would like. Uh, but yes, that's why we filter on the English language streams right now. Um, and we also filter on streams which are not flagged for mature audiences. So if you uh, are displaying a Twitch stream or if you just go and view a Twitch stream that's flagged as mature, uh, it'll ask you to click a button saying, yeah, I'm 18 years old or whatever. And uh, that kind of defeats the purpose of this app, which is to just kind of constantly show you something new um, without you having to do anything. It's just completely passive. Um, so this is what that looks like. Um, you're just making a request if you've ever done that in you know, Python or this is in Node.js. But if you've ever done any sort of REST API calls, that's what it looks like. So um, you make a request. If we get an error, like if Twitch is down or whatever, we just log that error and move on. Um, the whole app doesn't work if we don't have that, so that kind of sucks. But that's how it is. Um, and we'll return an empty array of streams. Um, if something else goes wrong, um, then we'll log the status code um, and that'll be it. Uh, but if everything goes right, then we should get this JSON payload uh, with all this stuff in it and we just go ahead and filter uh, by the mature streams there. And then this also kind of does that. And then just on the display in there. So uh, that'll get pushed into the array, and that's all we need. So then for, for each uh, stream that we get in that list, we will go ahead and kind of do these steps. So um, it, it's kind of like a batch sort of process, and this whole thing works on JavaScript promises. Um, is anybody unfamiliar with the JavaScript promises? Needs a rundown? No? Cool. Um, so recording a stream. Uh, there's not really a good solution that I know of uh, in Node.js for recording raw Twitch streams. If anybody knows one, please tell me, because it'll help me out a lot. <laughs> uh, but luckily, there's a Python package called LiveStreamer, um, which you know kind of makes this pretty easy. It abstracts away some of the like connecting to Twitch and recording stuff from it, um, and just acts as like an RTMP streamer. Uh, so for each stream, we can currently spawn a live streamer process to record a second or two of footage, wait a few seconds, trust that it works, and then kill it. Um, that's not exactly the best way to do anything. Um, so it kind of reminds me of this quote. <laughs> it's really bad. So we're going to go and fix that at some point. But this is kind of what it looks like right now. Uh, we start a promise, um, so that way, uh, you know, no, uh, nothing else in this main application logic uh, flow 
can happen until this is done. Uh, so here you see us spawning a live stream process. Um, we feed it a Twitch OAuth token, which is just an environment variable that is injected into our containers using Kubernetes config maps. Um, just, you know, simple secret storage. Um, and then you go ahead and set a timeout for four seconds. You just kind of wait, and then you kill it, and uh, you log uh, which stream was recorded and its name, and you resolve the promise. Um, that's about it. Go ahead. So this is on the client side, but you're running the live streamer on, on the server side? No, this is all server side. Okay. The only thing that uh, happens client side is that we refresh the iframe of which uh, Twitch stream is being displayed every 15 seconds. Yeah, that's the only client side thing that happens. Everything else is server. Um, so from there, we basically just have a directory uh, that contains a bunch of clips of Twitch streams, um, just .mp4s. And so now we need to, to actually just get a single frame out of that, just get one screenshot. So uh, Fluent FFmpeg, which is an NPM package that provides Node.js bindings for FFmpeg, which is, uh, it's a typo, uh, you know, is a super common piece of software for doing all sorts of things with video. Uh, makes this really easy. And this is kind of what that looks like. Um, again, same promise and rejection or resolution thing as every other step in this process. Um, just check to make sure the, the, the actual clip exists up here. Uh, do some logging. Go ahead and take a screenshot. Uh, put it into a specific directory, uh, make it a PNG. And uh, if that all works correctly, then this promise is resolved. If not, uh, we will go ahead and log the error and uh, reject the promise and just kind of move on. So if that happens, then uh, nothing else, like none of the other steps in this process will happen for that clip. Uh, so now we have a bunch of pictures on disk that kind of look something like this. Uh, it'll be you know, everything that's going on on their stream. Um, and, you know, I should have chosen one with like a streamer overlay, but whatever. Typically streamers will have overlays that, you know, top and bottom of all sorts of other things, maybe some chat interactions, maybe some fun um, animations for when people give them, you know, money, stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, this is essentially what it looks like. Uh, so from there, we just need to crop it down to just that number of live. Um, and we can utilize image magic. Uh, Rotisserie uses GM, which is, again, another NPM package, uh, which provides Node.js bindings for graphics magic and image magic, and those are just really good, um, you know, image manip manipulation pieces of software. And once again, it makes it really easy. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, speaking of uh, your everything that happens on the screen, mm -hmm. isn't, isn't there anything at any time that goes uh, on top of your uh, number of the live person and messes with the OCR? Yes, that can happen. Um, so typically what will happen uh, is if that number is so obfuscated that we can't read it, we'll just get back some garbage. And if, if, it's, if we can't read it, then we just throw it away. Somebody could <laughs> theoretically just always have them at two, you know, two alive if they wanted to. Um, you know, there's not really a whole lot we can do about that except just go. We do have have kind of a um, ban streamers functionality, so we we can create a list of like if so if we notice somebody doing that, we could add them to a list of banned streamers and just not have them anymore. So. I was just curious of the contrary, like if the developers of PUBG had mm -hmm. been careful enough that nothing would ever go over that number of that person, but no, this can happen. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and, and really, the developers of PUBG, um, one thing they did is they increased the transparency of the actual box itself. Uh, so what you would see, like say if that tree branch got in the way behind it, and uh, if, if you actually just cropped it down and blew it up, you could kind of see that tree branch. Uh, and then that would completely throw off our, our OCR. And that's, that's kind of why we got rid of Tesseract to begin with. Okay. Yeah. Um, so no, that was definitely a problem we encountered. That is mostly fixed. Cool. Uh, yeah, again, uh, another JavaScript promise. Uh, do some logging and uh, go ahead and just do the crop.
cropping right here, we crop to this specific pixel space. Um, we always record our clips in 720p because we don't need you know crazy you know 1080 resolution stuff going on. So we record in 720p and we know where this pixel space is going to be every time. Uh, we make it made it grayscale to try to get rid of some of that stuff, um, like what this gentleman was talking about, like you know with the tree branch or a mountain or something being behind it. Um, you know, on success, we'll log that we cropped the screenshot. And if there's an error, we'll just go ahead and reject it. So now we have a bunch of pictures that look something like this. Um, I didn't use one that we actually obtained just because I wrote this talk last night and was really rushed. But anyways, it generally looks like this. And let's talk about object character recognition. So we use Tesseract for kind of our proof of concept phase. And, and you know, kind of right in the beginning, um, but it had a, like a 30% success rate, uh, which was, you know, fine for POC, but bad for anything else. If you're trying to go and you know speak about this sort of stuff, um, and the transparency of the box containing the number of players alive completely threw it off. Um, so you would get back like, if you were lucky, you would get back a full number. Um, sometimes you would get a decimal number. No idea how that happened. Uh, sometimes you'd get back like a five and like a pipe. This is just complete garbage. Uh, so there were, was all these checks in there for like, you know, is nan, is int, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah, it was, it was bad. So luckily, um, one of my coworkers came in, uh, he got us a machine with a bunch of GPUs in it and a data center and uh, went ahead and uh, trained a neural net uh, specifically on cropped images that we had obtained from running our app and stored in a Kubernetes persistent volume. Um, not the best way to store things using Kubernetes, but good if you just need to go grab stuff. Um, the pre-trained model uh, is prov provided at build time for the OCR container Im image. Should have said image. Um, but it's just baked right into the image. Um, so if we want to train a new model, we can just go do that and then do a new container build and then push it out to Kubernetes. Um, and like I said, that flexibility of container deployments allows us to deliver updates pretty easily. And um, one thing that we started doing is, in the beginning of the game, uh, instead of alive, it will say joined uh, if, you're, if they're in the lobby, which you don't really want to be looking at games in the lobby anyways. So now we also have um, some code to go ahead and differentiate between games that are currently active and games that are in the lobby. Yep. Um, so are you guys using just a bare neural network, or are you basing it off some sort of specific architecture? Uh, we can go and take a look. Um, I'm pretty sure it's, it's pretty bare, though. Yeah, as far as I know. I, again, I don't want to go too deep into the ML stuff, because I just need to learn more about it before talking about it. <laughs> you know. um, but there, there's definitely, this is actually still kind of in the PR phase. Um, and I could show you, you know, give you a link to that PR. You can go and look at it if you want. Cool. Um, yeah. So, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, the accuracy of the OCR has improved up over 90%. Um, it's typically like in the high 90 range. So going from, you know, 27, 28% up there has been really good. And the app actually works now, <laughs> which is nice. Uh, so, Passing a file to the actual microservice itself, um, it just responds, um, you know, to REST API calls just like everything else does. Um, uh, so we will pass it, you know, create the images form data, um, and then the request options just has our rotisserie OCR service host and rotisserie OCR service port, um, which are kind of baked in at container image build time again, and the form data is just the form data done there, and then we just, you know, post it. If we get an error, we'll log it. Uh, if not, it should just give us back some plain text. And we can associate that number with its stream and shove those all into an array. And so now we have an array of stream names and their associated number of players alive. And we can just sort on the number and that'll choose us our quote unquote best stream. Um, Right now we only do, the Twitch's API is a paging API, and we only take the first page of streams out of that paging API. Theoretically, we could do more. Um, it would just take us a lot longer to do so. So we only take um, 
the top 10 or 15 streams right now. So how are they sorted? Hmm? How, how are they sorted? It's just an array sort. You just sort by the number of players live. No, no, but the, the page they give you. Hmm? The page they give you of the streams, how hmm? are they sorted? Oh, they're sorted, sorry. Uh, they are sorted by number of viewers. Okay. So we take the, the top 10 or 15 with the most viewers. Most top viewers. Yep, yeah. Um, and then here's kind of how we deploy it with Kubernetes. I'm going to do it on time. Oh, quite well. Um, we run it on the IBM container service since we work for IBM. Um, we don't want to be using GKE or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, we can, it can easily be shipped um, to, you know, your managed Kubernetes cluster platform of choice. Uh, new images are built and assigned a U UUID based on the hash of the latest git commit. Um, who here is familiar with like Kubernetes make files? Anyone? Cool. Uh, so in there you, you can uh, just um, kind of define things that you would normally do um, with Kubernetes images and uploading them and tagging uh, those container images. Um, and the first thing we always do is uh, just uh, set the revision. And we set the revision to the first six characters of the latest git hash. Um, that way it's always unique, fairly unique and easy to identify. Um, the secrets, are, like I said, for accessing the Twitch API are stored in a config, config map. Uh, that way we can keep our configuration artifacts completely decoupled from image builds. They're not baked right into the image. It's really insecure anyways. Um, we get our TLS with Let's Encrypt certs, and that's handled by this thing called Kubelego, which we're about to rip out um, because it's no longer supported by the latest Kubernetes versions, but there's a new thing called Cert Manager, which does the same thing. All that does is just get us HTTPS, um, so everybody gets the green check mark on their web browser. Um, and Nginx does reverse proxying. Um, this just runs as an express app on port 3000, and we just give that right into 80443. Uh, and then the ingress controller handles external access and kind of sort of provides load balancing. Um, I'm still personally unclear on how good that load balancing is, but it, it works. Uh, Rich History is shipped as software package in a Kubernetes chart. Um, so as you would have uh, pip or whatever the, the Go package manager is or NPM or whatever, um, Helm is kind of the self-labeled Kubernetes package manager. Uh, it just makes it really easy for us to ship around software to people who might not be super familiar with Kubernetes. They can edit probably one file or so and go ahead and deploy to their cluster. Um, and it gives us some benefits as well. Um, it ensures our builds are pretty reproducible. Uh, we can have multiple deployments of the app in the same Kubernetes namespace. So we can have one Kubernetes cluster that runs our, you know, kind of dev or staging uh, uh, deployment, and then also it's also running our actual production deployment as well, um, and that's kind of what we do right now. It also generates you out uh, a, a fun name, so uh, you know it'll it'll e it basically each of our pods are labeled uh, you know adjective noun, so it'll be like farty gnome or flabby opossum or whatever uh, dash whatever our pod name wants to be, and then some unique identifiers. Um, and then we can easily manage our Kubernetes manifest files by only really needing, like I said, to edit one file. Instead of going and editing all these crazy YAML files, if you want to be a YAML engineer, go ahead. Um, I'm done with that. So one file is nice. And this is typically what that file looks like. You might have some comments and stuff like that. But anyways, um, our image repository, this could be you know, on Docker Hub or wherever you like to store your Docker images. Um, the image tag is just um, our, our revision, which is, like I said, based on the git hash. Um, our host names, you know, if wherever you want it to be, um, it's on you to obviously manage your own DNS records, but uh, wherever you want it to be, and then www dot wherever you want it to be. And then uh, your, your secrets, um, you just go ahead and put them in base64, throw them in there. And then this Coop Lego stuff, throw your email in there, and then leave this Acme thing alone. And then from there, you can basically just do this. And then you should have all five pods that you would need. Questions? Go ahead. So you've got a single uh, container running the, uh, the, the two Node.js uh, apps. There's uh, only one of each. One, uh, yes. Um, so, let's 
Excuse and me. And e each time a user makes a request for, I would like a stream, please, does it do uh, the whole API call? Uh, so it, it's just server side, it's just doing that every 15 seconds and throwing it on, a, throwing that iframe yeah. that it decides on does into it, a web page. Does it cache that at all? Uh, not currently, no. Okay, yeah. so, so the first time you make a request, you have to wait like up to 15 seconds mm -mm. before no, no, no. Um, here. Whenever you make that request, we can just show it in action since we have some time. Um, it's probably not going to do too well in the bandwidth. So let's go to the next one. It should just be, yeah, right there. So there is some latency, like it says 9 down here at the bottom. If you look in the top right, it's eight is alive, um, but it's, it's generally good enough. I'm surprised the Wi-Fi is actually holding up. Uh, uh, this front end um, that is actually very pretty and way better than our first one was written by Rigel over here. Uh, thank you, Rigel. And it's got buttons for, you know, viewing the code and working on GitHub. But to answer your question, it's just always sitting there and you can, you don't have to go and wait. Um, okay, as, so, as so you it's, saw. it's remembering whatever the last mm -hmm. set of data is that it has? Yep. Yeah, that, uh, so that array that I was talking about is just a global array. Um, that okay. we, yeah. Is it going to interrupt one it's already put up to, if it finds a better one? Yes, so there is some talk about uh, working, you know, if you're if we're under five players alive or something, uh, probably. If it comes out and snipes it, it'll just go, oh, it's through the five game, go straight to the two players. Yeah, game. so we've been, uh, that's the whole reason we put on this, uh, hold on, there's a button. So like, say you're really, really invested in this game, you want to keep watching it, normally this would be unpinned, uh, but if you want to pin it, then it'll just keep it right there and keep it from switching. And then if you, you can just unpin it and then let it go. Um, so yeah, there, there has been some talk about like we should never switch under X number of players alive, um, but we, we kind of like to keep it free flowing right now. So the overall goal is to get the most entertaining stream mm -hmm. to the user, right? Yeah, the uh, one with the lowest number of players alive is what we consider to be the most entertaining. Yeah, I, I guess what I was going to ask is, how would you deal with streamers that would go to like populated areas of the map, such as school or the military mm -hmm. uh, zone, in every beginning of the game, because mm -hmm. it is entertaining, because there's a lot of people there. That's true. Um, I guess the overall question is, are you looking to expand it beyond just the number of players? Mm -hmm. Maybe also like the rate of how fast chat is going. Yep. Um, there was some talk about yeah. that or even uh, like looking at the mini map and using some edge de detection stuff to figure out where they are on the map um, and then go from there. So like, you know, we could have some button that says only show me people who are at school right now or something like that. Um, yes, we have thought about that. Um, it's, that's just a lot of engineering work. And luckily we, we've finally gotten, this is kind of our work side project, quote unquote. Um, so we use it as an excuse to like do some fun things. Um, but now that we've gotten from 27% accuracy to up into the high 90s, maybe we can start tackling some of those more interesting problems. Yep. So you said you're batching like 15 streams in each call mm -hmm. yep. and then recording for four seconds. So yep. it's like not that much data, right? Yeah. Can you do it all, do you do it all in memory or do you have to write stuff out to disk? We write it out to disk. Yeah. So that slows things down. Um, luckily, that's all happening concurrently. But yeah, they're, they're, like I said, there's that whole let's spawn a, a process and run it for four seconds and then kill it. Like, yeah. that sucks. Yeah. So, yeah, um, that's going to be kind of the next big overhaul is, is getting rid of that and then decoupling um, some of the logic out and making it just more microservicing. Have, have you, sorry, have you like, expanded the number of streams that you batch just to like stress test it and see just for funsies for yeah i've done that um i mean it, it's worked okay like into the 20s but once you get beyond that it's like nerf. it's too slow cool. yeah do you detect when the game is over uh so when the game is over obviously uh, there, there's no number in the top right luckily but i mean you just saw someone um I mean, I can't go back to it right now. But yeah, whenever I pulled it up, um, that streamer w was done with their game. Um, so that is another big problem for us as well, is detecting like in-game screens as, as quickly as possible, um, or them you know, booting back out to the lobby and making sure we don't display those at all. Yep. Um, when there's a kill on the count of flips, 
Is there an animation, or is it like nine in a frame and then eight? And there's the an animation. Frame? Yeah. So there's some soft animation. So how does the OCR deal with that? Um, basically, if, say if if there was an animation and there was just some non number in there, like it was like mid transition or something yeah. like that, or it couldn't identify the number. Yeah. Um, it would just throw it out. So oh. we, we would just be completely uninterested in that stream on that run, at least. Oh, but you don't even have to care about that because you, you record for like four seconds, four seconds, mm -hmm. you said? Yeah. So and we, we just take... Is always over four seconds, right? Yeah, so it's definitely. Um, so right now we just take the first frame out of that, but there has been some talk of like, hey, instead of just taking the first frame, we should take um, a frame at each second oh, that we record and then average the them frame. together and see what we get. But yeah, we, so we, why do you record four seconds if you only take the first frame? Uh, so we don't actually record four seconds. We let the process run for four seconds. And so that uh, how much footage it gets depends on how long it takes for it to uh, reach the Twitch API, get something back, and then okay. start recording. Okay. Yeah. When you say 90% accuracy, is that like in, when it's failing, is it it's thrown out all the results it's gotten? Or it's like, oh, this 23 is a... Uh, accuracy as in this 23 is a 23 and not a 5. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and actually detecting that number correctly. Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So Tesseract would be, you know, down in the 30% range or so. For us at least. I'm sure it, it, it's great for, for, uh, for other use cases, but it just didn't work out for us. Anything else? All right. Um, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, And we're live on dev.rotisserie.tv, uh, GitHub link, my uh, Twitter handle, and my email address, which is...